Good afternoon, everyone. I know it's been a long day for all of us, and for some of us, a relief. Some of us have yet to experience that relief. So we'd appreciate your patience and understanding as we try and speak a completely new language, which we have developed uh, throughout this project. So as you'll see, there's new terminology and new ways of looking at old models that we've experienced throughout this program. And so we appreciate your patience as we try and work through this, this new way of doing things. So today we're so happy and excited to present to you what we're calling the Purposeship Principles Standard, which is a guide for purpose-driven cross-sector relationships. Um, and similar to some of the guides that we've experienced in our master's program, such as the accountability uh, standards for stakeholder engagement, this is a similar approach for doing cross-sector relationships in a brand new way. And we approached this project because the three of us came from very different experiences, and we were particularly interested in issues of power, perception, trust, and transparency in partnerships. Many times we called it the T word in our master's program. We didn't know how to build it, how to measure it, how to create it, but we knew it had to be there. And so we were very passionate about finding, can we do something about it? Is there something that we can find that can really unlock that power and, um, and, and make relationships better? And what better place to learn than from nature itself? So the, what we ended up coming up with, what started as a toolkit, just for NGOs to pitch a, to a, a corporation and create a meaningful partnership, we realized in the end it wasn't a tool that we needed, and it wasn't just the CSOs, the civil society organizations that needed to change. What we needed was principles for all actors in the process, and we got that lesson from nature itself. So we'll ask you to watch this short video. So as you notice, birds, thousands of individual organisms are somehow able to fly in perfect unison, making art in the air, and they're not talking, and there's no leader, and there's no direction. And we found that to be a really inspiring metaphor for us and what we were learning about partnerships through this process. What we saw is that scientists actually say about flocks that they only use three principles to move like that. One is to maintain a minimum distance from your neighbor. Two is to fly at the same speed as your neighbor. And three is to always turn toward the center. And we really thought this could have some application for us as we explored partnership. We realized that partnership is development and development itself is natural. And yet we put procedures, we put benchmarks, we put tools, we, put, we try to humanize something that's beyond ourselves. And that's when we realized it was about relationships, and perhaps principles could guide better relationships. All too often, we ignore the reality of the ways in which humans and communities and our global ecosystem interact. And that's why we chose a principles-based model. So today, we're going to talk about why partnerships aren't working, what makes purposeship different, the principles standard, which is again the guide that we've created to help implement this and teach people about this new approach, and then our experience in working with it. Well, why partnerships aren't working? Oh, I took this picture this morning. <laughs> why partnerships aren't working? We decided to take advantage of our diverse experiences and backgrounds in order to analyze different perspectives on how and why partnerships weren't working. Uh, under the corporate perspective, you can see, I'm considered the pragmatic executive, came from the private sector, as you know, 15 years working for banks. Well, in my point of view, or in point of view of the corporate uh, side, the pressure uh, to respond to, to shareholders is not always seen by other partners. The partners in the partnership sometimes don't understand that this is who we have to, to answer first. So this forces us to a structure that forces a hidden agenda. Why? The benefits that we can attain from each partnership or each relationship we have cannot be shown in this arena because they, uh, our partners do not uh, accept that uh, we have the beneficial outcomes that goes to our shareholders. Uh, the third point is that our shareholders need 
the tangible results from, from the partnerships, every effort and every resource that corporations spend has to revert in beneficial outcomes. It's the nature of the business. And also, uh, although uh, people usually do not relate uh, corporations with emotions, corporations are people too. And the fact that uh, they are percepted, they and we and corporations are percepted as inherently evil and guilt for many of the problems that happened in the, in the planet uh, in history doesn't help engagement for corporations. So, the civil society organizations. <laughs> Let's see why partnerships aren't working from our perspective. I've been called the angry activist. And my experience has been around civil society organizations, nonprofits, and grassroots communities. And bringing the voice to the, of the community to this kind of partnerships is always very difficult and it's a challenge. What are the problems that we find from the CSO perspective? First of all, and ironically, is similar to the one that the, the corporations face, and it's the structure that forces a hidden agenda. CSOs also have to pay many things that are not included in the partnerships and that sometimes donors don't want to spend money in. And this becomes a problem and lack of transparency also from the CSO who like, really care about transparency, but they, they have these problems, we have these problems. This difficulty for, the, for, the, for spending money in our own organization develops a lack of resources to professionalize. It's very hard to spend money you get from partnerships or from different experiences in your own organization. And that delivers sometimes some problems with professionalization that corporations always say about us. Of course, and, and very related to what Andrea was saying, it's the pressure to demonstrate tangible time-bound results in a field where these time-bound results and, and tangible and it's not easy at all to find. We're talking about sustainability, these tangible and measurable things sometimes are so related to uh, procedures that it's not so easy. We're, we're working with people. And now comes the emotional side. We're, we're letting the emotions talk. And it's the anger and frustration due to the power imbalance. For civil society organizations, it's really hard to face the fact that when we sit in a negotiation table representing millions, corporations representing thousands or hundreds, win most of the times. And that is not a fair uh, feeling. That does not create a good feeling. And there's anger from our side. So I represent someone who hasn't grown up with these biases. We talked a lot about the generational issues that in the 80s when Andrea was, was growing and learning, the private sector was it. It was to make money and to uh, be professional and to be in kind of the busyness that is Wall Street. And then this other generation rose and really had a lot to say about it. And I've kind of come after that. And I see both sides, but I'm not as angry. And I'm, I'm, I'm angry that it's not working. And I think that that's how we all felt in the end. So they called me the conciliatory diplomat <laughs> because of my experience in, cro in cross-sector consulting. I I've worked with both sides. And even though I've seen some successes in my work, a lot of time it involves compromise. And I knew that everyone was losing as much as they were winning. And there were still some issues in the model itself. So together, once we kind of walked through this very difficult journey, heated moments, tearful conversations, you can imagine how the three of us worked together, uh, <laughs> we developed a really interesting shared view. We could find some things we agreed on which is that first of all, there are missed opportunities for transformation. A lot of NGOs put their hand out and say, you know what, I'm not gonna work with this corporation because they don't do this and this. But I think there too, they're neglecting the opportunity to walk alongside that corporation and maybe make some changes. And I think that's vice versa. The second thing is, is a lack of recognition of complementary expertise. These guys are in the business of development. And these guys have tons of resources and skills that can be applied to the developing world. And I think they miss that owning that own expertise as well as recognizing it from the other. And with that is the neglect of mutual beneficial outcomes. They both have hidden agendas. They both want to benefit. And the key thing about relationships in nature, the only reason why relationships happen is because you get a benefit. Why do you get married? Why do you have friends? It's such a basic <laughs> realization that we thought, why isn't this working between these sectors? And the, iron the irony of it all is they already know how to manage relationships. NGOs do it every single day with their communities. They're flexible, they're adaptable, they listen, they walk alongside of them, they're patient. And the same thing goes for corporations and their relationships with their clients. 
<clears throat> so we realized that in the development work, it's actually not a lack of resources or solutions. It's a lack of meaningful relationships. And this is where our whole conversation, our own journey, really took a turn. And we thought, oh God, we're here in front of the trust word. How do we navigate this? And that's when we went back on the idea of relationships themselves. We are proposing uh, a new kind of relationship between uh, different sectors. And this is where we realized that we needed, because we are changing the game, we needed a new name. Uh, partners or uh, players in this new field shouldn't confuse anything they had before or any kind of uh, relationship they had before with this new one. And this is why we decided to give specific names and very specific definitions for each role. First of all, purposeship is not a new kind of partnership. Purposeship is a new way to relate. Uh, each uh, player in this new game uh, we call them an agent. Why? Because we don't, we don't see any of the partners or any of the parties in this relationship being passive. They cannot, they will have to go and play. So this is why we call an active role and call them agents. Each agent contributes to the goal, which we call the purpose of the purposeship. And most of all, and this is very important, and we will come across this many times, every agent not only is able to contribute to the purpose of the purposeship, but is also committed to developing other agents within this same relationship. This is what we call shared purpose. It's the uh, purpose plus the development of each agent that is part of this relationship. So let's take a look on what we understand by partnership or the way we have analyzed partnerships. The partnership model is very, very related to the CSO, to the civil society organization. And it works toward usually the mission of the CSO. It's combining the mission of, to, of the CSO with the resources of the corporation. The, the partnership usually works with projects in parallel. The CSO develops, in this case, for different projects and finds partners for each project. These, these projects find the goal, individual goals. When you put all the goals together, you are achieving the mission of the, of the CSO. But what do we see in this model? First is the fact of them working in parallel. That idea of it's not so related. And the, the other thing is that sometimes parties are seen as suppliers. The partners that get together with the CSO are seen as suppliers and somebody who brings resources into their relationship. So at the end, what is the aim of partnership? It's going together. You go together toward a goal, a tangible, something that, that can like, fulfill that ne those needs that corporations have, the tangible, smart thing. The management is quite linear, where the CSO is like kind of coordinating all the projects. Uh, the parties are more considered uh, as suppliers it's based on uh, procedures like memorandums of understanding, phases, goals, deliverables, milestones. And the motives are mo uh, more than anything individual agendas. And the outcome at the end, it's accomplishment of the CSO mission with all the partners involved. Let's see how Purposeship uh, does this model. What happens in Purposeship is we now look at it as a network and we lump everybody into the same space. And when we do that, you'll see that the nodes, which formerly were this light blue color, now have another dimension. And when we have both dimensions, what we're talking about is needs and resources, because that's the reality. All of these agents that used to be in a partnership, of course they had needs and resources, but were they truly shared? And when we say needs and resources, that would be a corporation saying, we need some help with recruitment. Is there a way we can get our employees involved? Or a community not just being a recipient like we always tend to look at them, but being a rich resource of teaching something to others and being a supplier in their own right. And so by doing that, you realize the dynamism of development, that everybody's got something to give and everybody's got something to get. And by putting it on the table, you might avoid some of those issues in trust and transparency that we've been experiencing in the other model. 
Another fact with the other model is it, you can see in the linear ways, perhaps in one project, there's a partner that could develop a lot or learn more from one of the other linear projects that's going on. So you're missing a lot of key overlap that might be able to push the purpose even further. And so what we see here is the network working together, a network of needs and resources, not only reaching toward the development goal, but also the mutual benefits of themselves. And again, this is the key transformation is the common goal plus mutual benefits, which together produces what we call the shared purpose. So the aim now, it's not just going together, it's growing together. And by that you get more investment because you're interested in your own growth in the process. The management is nodular, these things move around. In one project, these might connect over here, or these needs might correspond with these resources. And every time the nonprofit or the CSO looks at the network through a different lens, it moves. Again, the parties are agents. It's based on principles, which we'll get into, adaptability, utility, and mutuality. It grounds all the activity within the purpose ship. The motives are reciprocal benefits. It's, it's about, I care about you and I care about this project. And the outcome is shared purpose fulfillment. If you remember in the last slide, it was CSO mission development. And in the current partnership model, it's almost like the CSO's mission rules, which is true. But if you, you can do more and invest more and get more out of it, if you deeply care about the agents in the partnership, the purpose ship <laughs> at the same time. So with all this in mind, our idea was to develop, as Kelly said at the beginning, some kind of equipment for these relationships to be possible. And we ended up creating a principle standard, a set of principles. We're getting out of the procedural side. We're just getting into what grounds a relationship. Relationships is what we're going to care about. Emotions, what, what the, part, the other person is bringing to you, not only in terms of a goal, a tangible goal. So uh, a purpose ship is a principle-based model for cross-sector collaboration in which agents embrace adaptability, utility, and mutuality in order to achieve a shared purpose. This is purpose ship. And now we're going to get uh, to the principles. Again, like relationships based on principles. And we're going to start with the principle of adaptability. Adaptability is the foundational principle of a purpose ship. We're going to read this quote here that changed the paradigm of evolution a few years, well, a few years ago, many years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and with, we're, we're reading that it's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives. It is the one that is most adaptable to change. Adaptability is key for any organism to survive, for every person, every organization. We've said it, corporations know how to adapt to their clients. They've been doing it. NGOs and CSOs know how to adapt to their communities, and they've been doing it. They have been adaptable, but have they adapted to each other? Have they really changed what they had inside? Had they made it a, a strategy? We don't think they had yet. Some had, have, but we still think that there's a lot to do. So what does the adaptability principle says? It says that alt agents shall consciously adapt to achieve the shared purpose. Agents that embrace the adaptability principle shall first commit, commit to conscious adaptation. And here the idea of conscious is key. It's not only that you adapt because you just do it. It's natural. It comes along with every organism. You do it consciously. You monitor the environment within and beyond the purpose. Because to adapt, you need information. Monitoring what, what gives you the information for adapting is very important. You analyze and incorporate relevant knowledge and understanding. So that information goes through your analytics. And then you adjust thinking and action to fulfill the shared purpose. Somehow adaptability, that it's already a strategy in its own, you adapt you to your stakeholders, uh, becomes something that puts together these two uh, organizations. The next principle is utility, and we call this the functional principle. Adaptability is what defines the purpose ship space and in the activities within. The next two principles help, help with the function of the activities that are happening. And so what utility does is it determines the types of contributions that the agents are able to give to the purpose, to contribute to the shared purpose. And of course, our good friend Aristotle reminds us that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So once you unlock that agency of the agents, you realize that it's not just about the contributions to the purpose, but there's shared purpose among them by using the mutual benefits as well. 
So utility asserts that agents, very straightforward, shall contribute to the fulfillment of the shared purpose. Agents that embrace this principle shall, first of all, commit to contributing to the fulfillment of the shared purpose. And by fulfillment, remember, shared purpose is not just the development goal, but the goals of other agents. Understand that contributions are defined as resources, insights, and changes in own organizational behavior. This is key. A huge outcome we wanted from this was to contribute to systemic change of these organizations. So in the current partnership model, a lot of it is, what can you give, right? Resources or insights, the skills of the corporate sector to the development work. But what if the corporate sector could actually, or should actually commit to changes in their own organizational behavior, or vice versa? A good example is if you're focusing on a purpose ship around youth empowerment, and you may have a corporation that gives tons of money every year, but they might not know in their own supply chain there's some kids that are building their shoes or knitting their shirts. And it, it opens up the space for two-way communication between other agents to say, hey, I have an idea for your utility. You might want to look at that supply chain. And that would really contribute to what we're calling a shared purpose. And that's what leads to the second one, identifying and suggesting contributions that the shared purpose requires from all agents. There's, the fact of agency is key. You can raise your hand and suggest something that you may see in another agent that they might not see in themselves. And enable the purpose ship to ensure the usefulness of all agents and recognize that because of that, contributions can vary in timing and scope. And in the paper, we get into a whole section on activity and dormancy, introduction of new agents, and utility is what determines when some agents may step back and others may really take the lead. And again, that depends on the emergent solutions and needs that are coming through the achievement of the shared purpose. Rather than all walking together and dealing with it together, you're recognizing the dynamism of development itself. Well, our third pr principle is mutuality. And it's also a functional principle because it gives the tone for the relationships uh, as they happen. Uh, we like to remember that most of relationships in nature are mutual. And as Mar Martin Luther King remembered us, not only in nature but in humanity itself, all life is interrelated. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. What the mutuality principle says, agents shall intentionally enhance beneficial outcomes for other agents in pursuit of the shared purpose. This leads agents to commit to the mutual development of agents as an integral part or component of the fulfillment of the shared purpose. You remember that we were uh, stressing that shared purpose is not only the purpose of the purpose ship, but also the development of each agent. This is a crucial part, and this is what mutuality principle is all about. Understand the right of all agents to receive beneficial outcomes identify and suggest beneficial outcomes for all agents. This is very key in the relationship because we want them to bring to the table the beneficial outcomes they want. And by knowing and under understanding that other agents in this relationship will be willing to develop your own, uh, your own beneficial, or or beneficial outcomes, it will make each agent to be more invested in the relationship and also increase the transparency because you, don't, you will avoid the hidden agendas. Uh, beneficial outcomes will be there. And also enable purpose to ensure uh, the equity of agents' beneficial outcomes. Uh, it's not that we will make it just for the beneficial outcomes. It is part of it. And it's important that every agent re uh, which is relating in this uh, in this collaboration is able to, to re receive beneficial outcomes. So we're going to finish with what was our purpose ship. We live through a purpose ship within this project. And uh, we like to see, and like one person once said, you can always connect the dots of your life when you look it backwards. You never know if the next step is going to bring you where you want to go. But still, you have to take it. So what we did is we started with the tools. Let's create tools. We want to empower them. Let's give them tools. 
we um, realized the emotional gap and we wanted to really acknowledge that emotions and those emotions and we those emotions brought us to the relationship this has been for us a very very important and meaningful relationship as well as with john who has been with us fighting crying and it's been very very difficult to put all it's been adaptability all around it's been utility and it's been mutuality for all of us we ended up defining the principles and the principles are what rule a relationship trust respect and letting the other grow so just think of a purpose like you would think of a marriage, of a friendship, or any kind of human relationship. And the principles that apply and not the procedures. The principles are listen, understand, and adapt. Give anything you can do best and try to help the other to grow. And this is the power of purpose. Thank you very much. <laughs> John, our referee, our coach, our mediator, and we're throwing erasers at each other. Thank you, John. Well, well, well done, Bill. <laughs> it has been a, a really challenging project. I didn't imagine, looking back at the dots, what we would have gone through, but it has been a really emotional project for the three of them, and for me as well. <laughs> but they have really put this into practice, and I think they've come up with something they didn't expect it when they started, but I think this can be the basis for future partnerships, rather purpose ships, because partnerships don't want to talk about. <laughs> and we've got a lot of people in the room from both sides. I'd be very interested in hearing what their view of this is, because what we agreed on this project, this is just the beginning. Now it's got to be tested, it's got to be brought out in the marketplace to see if there's a demand. But I generally think it is a, a really an innovative way forward for moving development projects. Daniel, do you want me to start? Okay, well, it's, I mean, partnerships are my baby, so <laughs> I have to take a huge interest in this. Um, I can see I'm going to have to start rethinking some of the ways I think about it. Essentially, what you're doing for me, and I think I told you, is you're, you're repositioning what I call transformative partnerships. And I think that, you know, I, I present you with my triangle where I say that partnerships should be about transactions, then moving up to relationships and change within organizations, and then to the bigger picture of changing the rules of the game. Okay, and I congratulate congratulate you on, on re reworking that. I think you've done it beautifully. And I also like the principles very much. We need new principles. We need to start thinking about new principles because the old ones are almost not fit for purpose anymore. I do take issue with one thing. You started saying why partnerships aren't working. Well, many partnerships don't work, but many do. I mean, I work with hundreds of partnerships in the European Commission, for example, that are working around employment issues, and they do work. And uh, I, I, I try to think, well, why, why would you have positioned it that way? And I'm wondering, if is it because your focus has been on corporate and CSO partnerships, okay? You very, you, you, although you've talked about cross-sector partnerships, you focused on those two audiences. And I think one of the reasons, and I'm thinking particularly about the, the, the employment partnerships I work in in Europe, is because the public sector, government, plays a fundamental role in creating an enabling environment and also um, a, a kind of, a, a sometimes a broker role in pushing an agenda for development. So I think one of the missing things, perhaps, and I'd like to ask you about did you consciously choose not to look at the public sector? Is there space for the public sector in this? Uh, because I think that that's something that, that maybe you'll need to bring into the picture and could actually enrich what you're presenting. Okay. I'm going to start with them. I'm sure. Mic microphone. Uh, I'm sure we all have something to say, so I'll try to be brief. And uh, you, I, I'm totally with you. And we knew this was coming. Like we just wanted to make it very tangible, like show the things that are not working. Of course, we know there's partnerships that work. And what we always say is that actually those partnerships that work are partnerships because they're based in trust. They're based in these three principles, and they are working because <coughs> not of, not only because of the procedures. They are working because other things. They're based in other things. And yes, totally agree. We just wanted to make it like very clear the transition from one way of looking at things to the this new way of looking. 
looking at things. And when we connect the dots, again, of our project, uh, what we wanted to do at the beginning was only related to CSOs and corporations. So then we realized that what we were creating was somehow general. So we tried to include the public sector, and it's all over the paper, but still, this is what we wanted at the beginning, and this is where we concentrated, because we thought that the emotional gap is bigger there than in the others. Okay. Yeah, uh, it was only last week or two weeks ago that we realized that we weren't seeing the whole picture. I mean, truly, this has been an evolution up until yesterday of we're really missing something there. And I think what we, in our paper, there's a section that we address this that talks about how the public sector is embedded in everything. I mean, it's arbitration, legislation, jurisdiction. That's what they do. So you can't avoid that. And they're almost the traditional experts in this in their own right. And, and they've got their own ways of doing it. And I think what we were noticing in the development, uh, the evolution of the development field is that the, this direct partnership between corporations and nonprofits is a new er era. It's, and it's bringing new challenges and new opportunities. And so I think that for the purposes of this presentation and simplification, and because none of us have really worked heavily in government, we weren't really able to speak to that in a concise way. But we recognize that, and I think it's only, again, in the last week that we decided to open this up to all agents and really be like, this could be something bigger. So um, that's a huge area that we need to develop. And I think that paper starts that conversation, yeah. And also within this aspect, uh, we totally agree that this is a work in progress. And we would be really willing to receive other stakeholders to bring their ideas to. Because we didn't have, and this is something we found out, we didn't have anyone from the government to give us uh, an opinion at the time that we decided to open for, for all the relationships. And that's why we recognize it's a work in progress and we would be really willing to, in the next steps, include other stakeholders in the conversation too. And I think it's uh, the last comment is um, it's such a well presented project. I have no questions. It's incredible because it's just so clear, so evident. At the same time, all of the projects, I think it's good that this is the last project because in all the projects, I see this collaboration, this communication, this coming together, this positiveness. And I like the way you explain the, f the flow of generations from I'm going to be a corporate successful person. That's bad. That's terrible. I'm going to drag it down into no, let's talk and let's make something, let's grow together. So whilst it's. Uh, beautifully presented, also amazingly innovative into the grounding of how collaboration can actually take place. And I'd be delighted after I talk with you to actually share this very widely to many networks that really are looking for new ways of collaborating because these principles are simple but really innovative. I've never seen them presented in such a way. Boom, three things that really say grow together with this. So really heartfelt congratulations. First of all, congratulations for your amazing presentation. You have created a piece of art in all its aspects, the visuals, the language, the structure. So I think it's, it's amazing. I have a, a question, uh, because I guess you want to engage a private sector, pragmatic businessman, and you want him on board, and you want him to, to engage to the standard. Maybe it still has a little bit of a new age taste or yeah uh, have you thought about the resources that you can use in order to engage him i mean I don't know, media um, what materials are you use because you have a barrier there so have you yeah. thought about it? i think again it depends on the audience when, when you present this kind of this kind of work um but the cool thing is and we kept saying this every time we face a challenge we say lean back into the into the principles themselves and in my work i actually just pitched to barclays a few months ago and I had to be adaptable. I couldn't walk in with the pictures of the kids on the, on the PowerPoint. I couldn't walk in with the, the narrative. And even my own boss, that's what his, that was his approach. And I kept sitting there saying, ah, they're not going to hear us. And I think this is the kind of presentation we might give to CSOs. And with that adaptability role in your mind and the utility of what you're trying to accomplish and the mutuality of understanding what a corporation wants to hear, my message was way different than, unfortunately, my boss, who likes to take that narrative, the kids are starving approach. So. I think uh, presenting the approach we haven't really thought through, but when you're trying to do something like this and you actually put the principles into practice, I think it falls right out of it. And I, I just witnessed that myself. Um, do you want to take it? Yeah, and, and we have uh, a whole 
chapter in the in the paper explaining that we believe that CSOs are the agents for for change and we think that these are the ones they are in the business of development and they understand these and they should they should could and should be the first ones to to take the leap and if I uh, were uh, a CSO right now I would look at this model and I would try to see the relationships I already have with the with some partners in partnerships or donors and try to present this new model to them i think it's all about discussing and and di dialoguing about this and this would be my approach for as a cso and just to finish and uh, very very quick uh, i think the mutual part is going to engage corporations that idea of you're not going to have to hide anything to me like just tell me, I would love to have this and this and this result in my own uh, corporation. Of course, and we didn't talk about it, but <laughs> I forgot to mention in the adaptability principle that there is a very big important put in the non-negotiables. It doesn't mean that you have to just negotiate with everything, but even like always if you're uh, fulfilling utility as a CSO, you can help a corporation to fulfill their needs. You have to make sure utility is there. You just can't avoid that part. So it kind of puts both worlds together. We're working towards the purpose, but we're going to give you what you want. And we think that's how corporations will be engaged. And yes, it's a little naive. It's a little, mm, I don't know if naive is, is the word. It's more based in principles instead of tangible things. But we do think that this is something that's coming along. It's not only us who are thinking of turning back to nature. It's, it's a tendency. We are all living through that. So we do think that it will happen. Any more questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.